All right. So, <coughs> in order to find a phaser in a particular at, at a particular instant, well, we have to recognize that the length of the phaser is equal to the peak value of that electrical quantity. So you have to take a look at the highest value and recognize that the uh, head of the phaser has to be somewhere on a circle uh, with radius equal to the peak value. Now the second thing is that uh, projection of the phaser on that vertical line has to correspond to instantaneous value of the uh, of that electrical quantity, which means it has to be that tall. Well, there are two points which satisfy this condition, this one and this one. Now, we have to, we, we, uh, can, uh, have to recall that as time passes by, the angle between the horizontal line and the phaser is equal to the phase. Um, so, over here, we see that uh, uh, that electrical quantity drops, which means that the projection has to drop. Well, if the phaser were like that, it would be growing, which means that it's this one. So here we have the phaser for that uh, electrical quantity. Uh, I don't know why did you um, several people came with an idea that, that the two uh, quantities on the, actually quite a lot of you, you drew different circles for current and voltage. They had the same peak value, so, so you should use only one circle. Or somebody even got three circles. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Let's now do it the other way. Uh, how about if we mark a phaser? Uh, so at a particular instant, let's say that the phaser has such a value. What is the plot of the, of the function? Well, we will have to recognize that the peak value has to be equal to the length of the phaser. Right? So I can rec recre recreate, actually, the circle. The phaser rotates along the circle over here, which means... <coughs> That, the, that this value over here is the peak value, and this one is minus peak value. The quantity oscillates between these two, these two values. Uh, <coughs> well, it's a sinusoidal function, so I can draw a sine function. And it doesn't matter even how I draw it, because it's up to me what, what point I choose as the reference. So what is 0, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So how about if I just draw a sinusoidal function? Now, uh, I see that, well, projection of the phaser is this much, right? So, so it means that that instantaneous value has to be somewhere on this horizontal line. It means that it's this instant, this instant, this instant, or another one, the one which crosses. Well, we have now to decide which one it is. Uh, I see that uh, since phaser rotates counterclockwise, the value of the electrical quantity grows up. So it must be this one. It could be also this one and uh, every other uh, with, with phase uh, different by uh, 2 pi. All right. <coughs> Let's now go uh, back to the lecture. And we were discussing relationship between voltage and current uh, for a resistor, for sinusoidal alternating current. So uh, we related uh, so far plots of voltage and current. And we see that they are proportional. When one gets zero, when current gets zero, voltage is zero as well. When current assumes the highest value, 
uh, voltage assumes the highest value as well. As, as well. Let's now take a look at the, uh, at the phasers. So, uh, and actually I will, at the same time, I will look at this as a, uh, uh, using complex analysis. I will think about complex current and complex, complex voltage. I recognize that voltage across the resistor is, is equal to the imaginary part of the complex voltage and current across the resistor is the imaginary part of the uh, uh, complex current. R is a certain real number. So I can write that this is imaginary part of complex voltage. And if R is, is real, then it doesn't matter if I have this r real uh, inside of imaginary part or outside. So now I can from that conclude that complex current, uh, sorry, complex voltage is equal to resistance multiplied by complex current. From that, I can immediately conclude what is the complex impedance of the resistor. Because complex impedance is a number which relates what with what? Which voltage with which current? You are right. Not peak. Which one? Yeah, I mean, here is, here is the problem. I told you that you will have a problem confuse, because you will start confused what are we talking about. So which current and which voltage are related by complex impedance? Let's recall actually everything. So let's start with this. Com uh, which, uh, uh, which coefficient relates complex current with complex voltage? A what? No. Complex impedance. Now, which, uh, which uh, uh, coefficient relates peak value of the voltage with peak value of the current? Impedance, correct. Which, uh, which uh, coefficient relates root mean square value of the voltage with root mean square value of the current? I mean, because this is where the problem with physics uh, is. We don't know what is what of what. And if we don't want what is what of what, how can we relate tho those? First, we have to know definitions, what we are talking about. And then when we know what we are talking about, we can use formulas. So, root mean square value of the voltage is related to root mean square value of the current by a what? Not average power. Not phase angle. Impedance, correct. It's also by impedance, like peak value. Peak values are related by impedance, and, and root mean square values are related by impedance. Uh, now, how? Instantaneous uh, value of a voltage is related to instantaneous value of the current. Can, what is the coefficient between those two? A uh, what? I? What is I? You mean we multiply current by current to get voltage? Current by resistance. Is it true? Do we multiply current by resistance to get voltage? No. Only for a certain type of elements. Which type of elements? Only resistors. Only for resistors, current and voltage uh, uh, are proportional. I mean, th that question was kind of tricky because we don't have a coefficient which relates uh, current with voltage. Yeah, so th we don't have a universal coefficient which will relate instantaneous value of the current with instantaneous value of the voltage. Recall that in a capacitor, we have to calculate the derivative of voltage in order to get current. In an inductor, we have to calculate the derivative of the current in order to get the voltage. Only in a resistor we multiply uh, current by a number to get uh, voltage. All right, let's go all over. 
So uh, root mu square value of the voltage and root mu square value of the current are related by impedance, correct. Peak value of the voltage and peak value of the current are related by impedance. Uh, complex voltage and complex current are related by complex impedance, correct. And uh, current and voltage are related by not related, all right. <laughs> they are not proportional in general. They are only proportional in a resistor, and then it would be resistance. All right. So here we have a, an expression which relates complex voltage with complex current. Here we see that in a resistor, complex voltage is proportional to complex current. What do we call the proportionality coefficient between complex voltage and complex current for an element? Not resistance. Complex impedance. What's the conclusion? That resistance of the resistor is equal to the complex impedance of the resistor. Correct. So complex impedance of the resistor is always equal to uh, resistance. How about impedance? Is impedance equal to resistance? Yes, we found it yesterday. Yesterday we also found it. So for a resistor, impedance, complex impedance and resistance are equal. All right, now if we have complex impedance, how to find impedance itself? What do we have to do with complex impedance? It's a, it's a, it's a simple procedure. We take an absolute value of it. Okay. So if we take absolute value, uh, I mean, let's say that I have a resistor which, which has resistance 10 ohms. And if I, so, uh, uh, so its complex impedance is going to be 10 ohms. What is absolute value of this complex number? 10 ohms, correct. In other words, if uh, impedance, well, ah, impedance itself is going to be also equal to resistance, which is consistent, consistent with this, what we found yesterday. Because yesterday we came to that conclusion that impedance is equal to resistance. Also yesterday we came to, uh, came to the conclusion, what is the phase angle? What's the phase angle for a resistor? Zero. How do, how do we see it from the plots? Because they are proportional, there is no phase shift. Yeah, they are always in the same phase. When one has phase zero, the other has phase zero. When, when one has phase pi over two, the other has uh, phase pi over two. Now, how do we al actually calculate uh, uh, phase angle from complex impedance? I mean, these are the two formulas which are really very good to remember. How to find out impedance and phase angle from complex impedance. Well, I will have to take ratio of imaginary part of complex impedance of a real part of complex impedance. What is imaginary part of this complex number? Let's say 10 ohms. Yeah, so if it is 10 ohms, real uh, imaginary part of this number is 0, correct. And real part is 10. Yes, yeah, so I will have 0 over 10. Tangent phi is 0 over 10 angle of, uh, sorry, um, tangent of what angle is equal to zero? Zero, correct. So we see that the phase angle is zero. All right, let's now draw uh, the two phasers. Yeah, so let's say at this instant. And again, I already skipped drawing the circle. But first of all, indeed, I would, in, in principle, I should draw a circle equal to the, with radius equal to the peak value of the current, then draw a horizontal line and mark, uh, mark uh, I mean, find where the horizontal line crosses the circle and select one which corresponds to the rising current. I, I skip that. <coughs> I hope that you already comprehended it. Now, how should I draw the phaser representing voltage? Right, it should be parallel. Yeah, the two phasers 
have to be in the same direction. Yeah. Over here, we actually see that the phases agree, yeah, because where is the phase? Phase is the angle on the phasor diagram. It's the angle between the horizontal uh, axis and the phasor. So both have the same angle. All right, so as time passes by, both current and voltage oscillate, and the phasors rotate together counterclockwise. All right, let's now take a look at another, uh, at another element, and an inductor. Uh, how, how current and voltage are related in an inductor, could you remind me? Uh, if I know current, how to find out what is the voltage across the inductor? If the current in the inductor is, uh, let's say, f uh, 5 amperes, what is the uh, voltage across the inductor? Let's say that inductor has inductance of 1 Henry. 5 volts. How did we get it? And this is wrong. We don't, we don't multiply uh, current by inductance in order to get voltage. What do we have to do? Yes. Uh, no, well, not, no, I mean, this is what we are going to discover now, but we, because I have not, uh, we don't know what is impedance at, at this point. And, uh, and by the way, that, we impedance, I mean, one thing, impedance is only for sinusoidal currents. Now, I'm asking you in general, yeah, because only for sinusoidal currents, look, the phasers make sense only for sinusoidal. Now, if it is not a sinusoidal, we can always think about that it's a superposition, a superposition of sinusoidal currents uh, and, uh, well, kind of reconstruct uh, any type of, uh, of a current. Uh, but uh, this requires a, a Fourier analysis, and, and when you will learn it, then, then, uh, then you can do it. So, so, uh, but right now, we will restrict uh, impedance, a concept of impedance phase and, and uh, uh, sinusoidal function and phasor only to sinusoidal uh, currents. Uh, now, I'm asking for a general relationship between current and voltage in an inductor. And, well, how was inductor defined? What was it? Anybody remembers what's an inductor? <coughs> well, it was ele electrical element with two sides, like like resistor and capacitor, for which potential difference and current were related in a particular way. And now we have to recall how they are related. Again, we have to know what is what of what. Rate of change in current was proportional, is proportional to potential difference. So we have to calculate the derivative of the current and then multiply the derivative by inductance to get uh, voltage. So if current in the, in the uh, inductor is 5 amperes, and if it is constant, then what will be the voltage across this inductor? Zero, right. Now, if you think about uh, more general, that I say that this 5 amperes was an instantaneous value of the current, what would be the answer? No, because maybe, maybe, it, uh, maybe the derivative is not zero. Yeah, the answer would be not enough information. You wouldn't be able to say, because the important thing is how it varies, not uh, how, uh, uh, what is its value. Uh, so, for example, <coughs> let's say that I have this one Henry uh, uh, inductor, which is actually quite a large inductance for an inductor, but that's fine. Uh, if I want to have one volt across the inductor, what kind of current should flow through that uh, inductor? Not zero. A what? 
Not one ampere alternating current. In what sense, one ampere alternating current? Sinusoid, very sinusoidally? Yeah. No. Right, the rate of change in current would have to be uh, one ampere per second. If the current is changing that way, then the voltage would be uh, one, uh, one volt. Uh, actually, Well, let's say that I want to maintain one volt potential difference, how the current would have to vary. It would have steadily to grow. This is how the current would have to vary. I, and the ne next week I'm going I, uh, maybe to, to, to prepare a presentation so, uh, or demonstration. So we will see it. All right. So let's now come back to this. Uh, current and voltage in an inductor. So let's say that I start with the current, which is a trigonometric function of time. And so this peak value of the current times signs of angular frequency of the current multiplied by time the instant at which we calculate the current plus initial phase of the of the current. Now in order to relate this to uh, voltage I would have to calculate the derivative of it and multiply by inductance. How did I know that? How did I know that I have to uh, take the derivative and multiply by inductance? Because we are talking about inductor, correct? So it's from the definition of inductor and inductance. Uh, all right, let's now calculate the derivative of this expression. Uh, here we have a constant. I can take it in front. And then derivative of a composite function. External function is the sinusoidal function. Internal function is a linear function. So which rule are we going to use in order to differentiate this function then? Chain rule, correct. Uh, all right. So I have this peak value from, from here. Well, omega came from the derivative of the internal function. Uh, derivative of sine function is cosine function. All right. I almost have voltage written as a sine function, except that it isn't sine function but cosine function. I now have to convert cosine into into sine. And it's easy actually to do because uh, uh, cosine and sine function are just shifted. So I can write down that cosine of a certain argument is equal to the sine of the same argument plus pi over 2. Now I wrote voltage as a sinusoidal <laughs> function of time. Yeah, I have a certain number times sine of angular frequency times t plus a certain number. Now, looking at this expression, how big is the peak value? Well, how is it related to peak value? Well, I mean, in, in terms of the quantities which we have on the, on the uh, screen. Yes, Bill? Right, which means omega L times I M. This entire expression here is the peak value of the voltage. This is peak value of the current. Uh, so what is impedance of the inductor? How much? Angular frequency, not velocity. Angular frequency multiplied by inductance, correct. Yeah, because if I divide this expression, which is peak value of the voltage, by the peak value of the current, I will get omega L. 
So omega L is the impedance of the inductor at frequency omega. Note actually a major difference between uh, impedance of an inductor and impedance of a resistor. Impedance of a resistor was the same for at all frequencies. Impedance of an inductor varies. So if, uh, if, a, uh, if current oscillates slowly, impedance of the inductor is high or low? Low, correct. And the higher the frequency, the higher the uh, impedance of the, uh, of the inductor. All right, let's now look for the phase angle. What will be the uh, initial phase? Uh, no, phase angle uh, produced by the inductor. Now, what is phase angle, by the way? What is it? Uh, so, so that we know what is what of what. Uh, for, first of all, phase angle is not an angle. It had, we can interpret it as an angle somewhere where? Not at the instant, on the phasor diagram. But if you look at these two, there is no angle anywhere here. Over here, for example, I can recognize what is the phase angle uh, between voltage and current. By definition, what is phase angle? It is just a difference between phase of the voltage and phase of the current. You can also think about that it's a difference between the initial phase of the voltage and the initial phase of the current. At, at any instant, it ha it, it has going, it's going to have the same value. So how about if we look at this? Let's say I consider this instant. What is the phase of the voltage? Voltage is the blue represented by the blue plot. What is the phase of the voltage at, the, at instant zero here? Oscar? It isn't negative pi over two. It's just pi over two, right? The value is one. I mean, uh, the highest value, right? So it means the phase, the argument of this sine function at uh, t equals zero is pi over two. All right, so phase, and rem let's remember that. So phase of the Voltage at, at instant zero is pi over two, which is actually the initial phase of the uh, voltage for, this, uh, for these two plots. What is, what is the phase of the current at this instant? Zero, correct. Can we subtract those two? And which we should subtract from which? From the phase of the voltage, we have to subtract phase of the current which means that from pi over 2, we have to subtract 0, and the result is going to be pi over 2, right? So, so if, I look, if I look at these two plots, phase angle is pi over 2. Let's, let's now choose another instant. How about this instant? What is the phase of voltage at this instant? How much? 0, correct. Uh, and this one? Negative pi over 2. 0 minus negative pi over 2 gives us pi over 2 again. Right. So, no matter what, we always get pi over 2. And, and if, we, if we take look, uh, a look over here, this number over here is the initial phase of the voltage. So, initial phase of the voltage is equal to initial phase of the current plus pi over 2. So what's, I mean, if I look at this expression, what is the phase angle? No, pi over 2. Yeah, because from, that, from this number or from this number, I have to subtract either this number or this number. So no matter what, I will get pi over 2. So in an inductor, uh, impedance is equal to angular frequency multiplied by impedance of the uh, inductor and the phase angle is always pi over 2 which means uh, we say I mean if it is pi over 2 we say that the uh, voltage leads the current by phase pi over 2 or we say also that current lags behind voltage by uh, pi over 
over 2. Phase of the voltage always happens a little bit earlier than phase of the current. Look at that. At this instant, voltage has phase pi over 2. Well, we have to wait one quarter of a cycle for the current to get to phase pi over 2. At this instant, phase of the voltage is pi. We need to wait <coughs> quarter of a cycle for the current to get phase uh, pi. Let's now take a look at the phasers. Oh, average power delivered, uh, delivered to, the, to an inductor. Well, average power delivered to an element depends on the root mean square value of the current flowing through the element and potential difference across the element times cosine of the phase angle. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so on average, inductor does not consume power. <coughs> it is that in certain, par certain uh, fragment, well, actually, we can take a look at this. <coughs> Let's say at this instant, how much power is delivered to an inductor? Zero. Uh, now, in this interval, uh, uh, power delivered to the inductor is positive, negative, or zero? Positive, yeah, because both current and voltage are positive. How about this in uh, interval? Negative. Current is positive, voltage is negative. So here, here the inductor delivers uh, power to the circuit. Now, here is again positive when both, are neg b both uh, electrical quantities are negative. And negative and positive. So inductor, in an inductor, we deliver power, take it away. Deliver power, take it away. Let's take a look now at the phasers. So <coughs> we start again with the relationship between voltage and current for an inductor. Uh, uh, and I, I recognize that here I have uh, imaginary, that voltage is imaginary part of the complex voltage and current is imaginary part of the complex current. And since uh, when we calculate derivative of a complex number, we separately calculate derivative of the uh, real part and imaginary part. And since L is a real number, I can recognize that this expression is imaginary part of such a product. So I can now relate complex voltage and complex current by the same relationship as voltage and current are related. Uh, all right, and let's now say that I take current, I mean this complex current, I will write complex current as a, a complex amplitude of the current multiplied by E2 I angular frequency times time. Well, this is a certain constant. I can take it in front. Uh, derivative of exponential function this is still a composite function. E external function is exponential. Internal function is uh, linear. And the uh, coefficient in front of the variable is i omega. So derivative of the internal function will be just i omega. And Exponential function has this property that when you calculate the derivative of exponential function, you get again exponential function. So it is just uh, so calculating the derivative of exponential function is equivalent to multiplying the function by a certain constant. Well, that constant here is i omega. All right. So this way, I was able to relate complex voltage with complex current. In general. Proportionality coefficient. The proportionality coefficient between complex current and complex voltage is called. You will have to go again uh, through all uh, to, re to repeat uh, the relations. So, what relates uh, impedance, uh, sorry, root mean square value of the voltage with root mean square value of the current? Impedance, correct. What relates. Uh, um, Peak value of the voltage with peak value of the current. Impedance. What relates current with voltage? Nothing. Good. What relates complex voltage with complex current? Complex impedance. Correct. <coughs> All right. So the proportionality over here, Adam is right, is indeed complex impedance. 
<coughs> I omega L is the complex impedance of the inductor. All right. Uh, on the previous slide, we found actually what is impedance. Can we, can we verify that everything agrees? Yeah, because in, uh, how from, that, from this number find impedance? What do we have to do with complex impedance in order to absolute value? Correct. Abs you're absolutely right. Okay. So when we calculate absolute value, it is, it is equal to, I mean, of a product, it's equal to product of absolute values. What's absolute value of I? One. All right. Uh, now, omega is a positive number, absolute value, uh, and real. So absolute value of omega is omega. Absolute value of L is L. So, oops. Uh, I mean, this is where we would mark the number. And... Uh, impedance is indeed angular frequency times inductance of the inductor, what we saw on the previous paragraph. Now, can we find out that pi over 2 to be the phase angle? Because how do we, f yes, how do we do that? Oh, we can take it as the, as the angle on the phase diagram. I mean, this angle over here is indeed pi over 2. But from this number, directly from this number, can we calculate that? Well, recall that tangent of the phase angle is equal to imaginary part of the complex impedance by real part of the complex impedance. What's imaginary part of this number? No. Omega L. The number which stands next to I is the imaginary part, not I itself. So imaginary part is omega L. How about real part? Zero, correct. So we have omega L over zero. Omega L is positive over zero, so we will get plus infinity. Tangent of what angle is equal to plus infinity? Oh, so actually, I can write down the tangent is infinity. Tangent of what angle is uh, uh, plus infinity? Pi over two. So everything agrees. All right. So if we draw now the phasers, I mean, let's say that I draw a phaser at this instant. Uh, how about if I take the same phaser as before? Uh, I recall again that first I have to imagine a circle. Uh, actually, I can, I can do it the other way too. Uh, I can first draw the line, horizontal line, and then I can take a measure this distance and see which will, which can have length equal to peak value. All right. Now, how about phasor of the voltage? Where is the phasor of the voltage? Now that voltage is already dropping. It will be in the second quadrant. Right. And actually, this phase angle, pi over 2, you should see it here. Where do we see it? Where is it? It's the angle between the phasor uh, representing current and the phasor representing voltage. So over this angle over here is pi over pi over 2. All right. And as time passes by, both phasor, phasor, phasors rotate and the uh, current and voltage oscillate. Let's now go to a capacitor. Uh, and how voltage and current are related in a capacitor? Yeah, let's say that voltage uh, across a capacitor is 5 volts, and capacitance of a capacitor is uh, 1 millifarad. What current flows through this capacitor? Zero. Very good. How did you get it? Because we have to take derivative of voltage, correct? <clears throat> because current flowing through the capacitor is equal to the rate at which charge on the capacitor varies. Right? And if we keep constant voltage across the capacitor, charge on the capacitor is going to be constant as well. Uh, all right. So I'll, this time I will start actually not from the current but from the voltage because that way I will calculate derivatives rather than integrals. So uh, uh, if I write now voltage, uh, 
at instant t to be equal peak value of the voltage times sine of angular frequency plus uh, initial phase. How do I get uh, current from that? What do I have to do it to do to that? Differentiate it. Well, if I multiply it by C, I will get charge, and now I have to differentiate it. All right, so if I differentiate now this function, it's again composite function. External function is trigonometric function, internal function is uh, linear function. After integration, I will get this cosine function, and uh, well, in order to determine the phase and peak value in principle, I want to have sine function. Well, cosine function is related to sine function by, I mean, they are just shifted. So I got this, uh, this expression now. I, current at instant t is equal to this number multiplied by sine of angular frequency plus this number. Uh, so what's the peak value of the current then? Omega C times Vm. All right. So angular frequency times capacitance times peak value of the uh, voltage. So how about impedance? What, what is there for impedance of a capacitor? Impedance of a capacitor. Remember that impedance of a capacitor relates what with what? I mean something which will be useful here. Peak value of the voltage with peak value of the current. Right? Impedance is equal peak value of the voltage divided by peak value of the current. Let's do it. This, is, this expression is, is equal to what? This is peak value of the current. So it should go to the numerator or the denominator? Denominator. What should be in the numerator? Vm, correct. So Vm and Vm cancels and impedance of a capacitor, oops, and impedance of the capacitor is 1 over angular frequency times capacitance. Now this number over here represents the initial phase of the current. So I see that initial phase of the current is equal to initial phase of the voltage plus pi over 2. What's the phase angle? Now, make sure that you do not confuse what to subtract from what. So, from the initial phase of the voltage, from delta V, we have to subtract initial phase of the current. So, we need, we need to subtract delta V plus pi over 2. Well, delta V and delta V will cancel and we will be left with pi over 2. Uh, so, phase angle is minus pi over 2. Did I say pi over 2? I think so. Yeah, so phase angle is minus pi over 2 this time. Which means that, uh, that the phase relationship is opposite to what happens in the inductor. This time, phase of the current happens earlier than phase of the voltage. Look that at this instant, phase of the current is pi over 2, but we have to wait a quarter of a cycle for the voltage to get to that phase. We say that current leads the voltage by pi over 2 and voltage lags the current by uh, uh, pi over 2. Now let's take a look at the average power delivered to a capacitor. And again, because the phase angle is minus pi over 2, cosine of the phase angle is 0 and the average power delivered to the capacitor is also 0. It's again if you look at the plots, uh, at this instant, at this instant, power delivered to the uh, capacitor is negative. In this interval, it's positive. Negative. Positive. Negative. Whenever it's positive, it means that we deliver energy to the capacitor. Whenever it's negative, capacitor delivers energy back to the circuit. On average, the capacitor doesn't deliver energy to the circuit at all. Uh, so I think that, I mean, I don't have time to go through the, through the complex analysis. Why don't we uh, end at this point, therefore?